Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back to the channel. It's been a long time coming, but I'm gonna finally give a shop tour of uh, my garage shop. You guys have probably seen me in here at different points in different videos, and you might kind of wonder what the context is and uh, how this kind of evolved to be what it is. So that's what we're gonna talk about in this video. I'm gonna talk a little bit about how it came to be, how I make money out here, and kind of the limits of uh, how it holds me back from growing and why I'm also kind of looking to expand to a different shop. So first off, a little bit of context. This is the attached garage that is attached to my house. And literally, if you go through this door, we can walk right into my kitchen um, where my family is usually doing stuff. So it's nice in that regard to be really close to the family. Also extremely annoying at times as well when you're trying to be productive. But I would say uh, overall it's been fantastic at this stage of my family life and business growth to have it out here. It's allowed me to put in a lot of hours while still being very connected to my family while I'm working. We also put, should probably hit on the elephant in the room. Um, you will find some random golf clubs scattered throughout. And if you look down here, uh, there is a golf mat. My shop also doubles as the golf simulator room as well. So usually there's like a net right here this time of year. I actually pulled it out of the shop to do this little tour. Um, but I also spend family time out here as well, hitting golf balls in the evenings. So if you see this thing throughout the, uh, the video tour, that's my SkyTrack launch monitor. Absolutely love it. It works great. Um, so yeah, you make do with what you got. One of the key things we all want to know when we look at somebody else's shop is how big is it and what kind of square footage do they have. So this obviously is an attached garage. So it's designed um, with two overhead doors. Size width wise is 36 and 30 deep. So it's a pretty decent sized three car garage. Whenever I basically remodeled and built this onto the old house, I didn't realize at the time how key this garage shop would be to my future, but it's been huge having this space available to me to use at a shop. Obviously, I use all of it up with me just by myself. We haven't actually parked our vehicles in here in years, um, but it works pretty well. It's a little bit annoying having one whole wall of the shop basically being overhead doors that really limits your ability to put tools on this wall. And then if we also turn around to this wall over here, I've got a lot of doors going to the outside, going down to the basement, and then going into our kitchen. So I don't have a lot of usable space there. Whenever I do have a job where I'm building a lot of built-ins, this is the area where I stage my materials. I'll typically have two stacks of plywood and I will actually block these doors off. You've probably seen it in other videos. I mean, I've had 30 sheets of plywood stacked up against this wall here and here. And that's just kind of part of making do with what I've got. And then here on the floor, I'll put in, you know, a bunch of my, my one by material. I just drop it on the floor. But that is whenever I have a job that I'm just building a lot of stuff, um, turning it into cabinets and knowing that it'll be out the door eventually. This area is also where I'll usually stage uh, my finished product products. Once I build bookshelves and stuff like that, usually all gets stacked over here, then loaded up and transported later. So let's talk a little bit about how this evolved from being our garage into a shop. Basically going back almost 10 years now, I started out my business um, doing remodeling, doing bathrooms and things like that. I didn't really need a shop that much. This was used more for storage. Uh, of tools and things like that. I also didn't mention previously, but you'll see the stairs going up over here. I have attic trusses above this whole thing. So I've got a 16 foot wide by 36 foot long attic area, basically an attic room 
that serves as storage for me as well. Um, but as my business changed, I started trimming more and more houses and really started to feel the need and see the advantage of having a dedicated shop space. So I had to make a decision. Um, one, basically one winter, I remember making the decision to buy uh, a dust collector system. I bought a table saw. I bought uh, my five horsepower planer over there. And then I also bought this jointer over here all in one winter and got that all set up. And that was really the beginning of the evolution, changing this into from a garage into a dedicated shop space. One of the key things I feel like you've just really got to have if you wanna keep things even somewhat clean and just be practical is a good dust collection system. So I purchased this Oneida. I believe it's a five horsepower dust collector and it's really worked well for this size shop. Whenever I'm prop processing a lot of material and planing, this uh, barrel drum does fill up pretty fast. So as I grow and move into another shop in the future, I'll definitely have to upgrade this and probably sell it. But for this size shop, it's worked out really well. And Oneida actually um, designed the, the piping system, the duct system. I basically gave them a print of what I wanted, uh, where my key machines were gonna be, and they sized all of this duct work appropriately uh, for the different machines, and it's just worked really well. So the dust collector is huge also, being co connected to my house. Um, I make a lot of sawdust out here, so I have to keep it decently clean. Otherwise, me and my kids are constantly tracking sawdust into the house, which is no bueno with the wife, obviously. Um, so that's one of the disadvantages, but it also forces me to kind of keep this space pretty clean. It's usually pretty easy. I'll actually just raise the overhead doors, take my big um, DeWalt 20 volt blower and just blow everything right out the doors and it stays pretty clean. Um, you will also notice this is insulated really well. It's got two by six walls, spray foam, blown cellulose insulation. And I came up with this heater system to heat it. Um, this is a temporary solution. I always knew that I wanted to move into a different shop space eventually. So it didn't make sense to put like a mini split or something like that out here just knowing that ideally eventually I would be moving somewhere else. So this heater system has worked just fine for me. It's probably not up to fire code, but it gets us through and it heats the shop up pretty quickly in the winter. I can just come out here, turn it on, you know, give it a half hour and it's very comfortable out here. So let's talk a little bit about how to lay out a shop. First off, where we're standing right here, this is, again, my material staging area that I keep pretty open, also the golf simulator area. Um, and then as we move over here, I feel like you wanna start designing your shop around the constraints that you have. So for my planer, for example, I knew at times I would be needing to run 16 foot material through the planer and that is a big constraint because you need to have a 16 foot lane going both ways and in a small shop garage like this, that's a real challenge. So I put this here strategically because if I am gonna be running really long material through there, I can just open up this door and gain a lot more space to do that. So that is part of why that machine basically has to be there. Now we move to the table saw. Again, you're just kind of trying to find the sweet spot on where it works best. Also with this, if I am gonna be running some longer material, I can open this overhead door, which I've had to do many times. Most of the time, I'm not ripping things that are longer than 10 feet long. So I've got a solid 10 feet going back here to this door and I can comfortable process comfortably process sheets of plywood right here as well with, with plenty of space. So that's why this is where it is. I've also kind of got it at an angle to maximize my lane going through here. 
Um, again, processing long boards, when I need to do that, I've got as much space as I can. I think I can actually get 16 foot through to that wall, but I don't have to rip 16 foot material very often. If we move over here to this wall, this is probably one of the more not ideal scenarios that I have to deal with with this shop space. If you could have 16 foot long on both sides of your miter saw, that would be really ideal. Unfortunately, I don't have that. Um, I've got probably a little over eight foot on this side of the saw and maybe 16 foot on this side. Again, it's not like I'm really needing to cut a full 16 foot board very often in my workflow. But um, this, this has worked out okay, but I will definitely look forward to the day when I have a shop that's got a, a better miter saw set up. Um, the nice thing about a one-man shop is you're just one person. So you don't have to worry about tripping over other people very often. And that also allows me to have something like this jointer really close uh, in proximity to everything else going on here. And it might look a little bit cramped having table saw, jointer, miter saw all so close together, but this area right here is phenomenally efficient for me. I can process things on the table saw, I can cut things on the miter saw, and immediately, without hardly making any footsteps, be right at my jointer, or right over at my planer. So for a one man show building built-ins and stuff, this size space, even though it's not very big, is actually extremely efficient. So let's uh, talk a little bit about Polk style tool trailers and workbenches. If you guys are like me, you've been uh, in the, the know for a long time looking at tool trailers and workbenches, Ron Polk kind of revolutionized that whole mindset and concept whenever he designed his Polk workbench, which is a great design. I had a 16 foot tool trailer that was completely Ron Polk style. And eventually I sold that and I had a bunch of the stuff from that trailer left over. So this is like a Polk tool trailer graveyard in this shop. So first off here, my workbench, I used to think that taking this on site was a solution when I first started trimming houses, found out that was completely impractical. So this got salvaged from basically the two pieces, screwed them together, built a base under this, and this has been my workbench for probably eight years now. It's been extremely well used. As you can tell, there's probably gallons and gallons of glue wiped all over this but uh, it served me well. I haven't built anything else because again, I've always had in the back of my mind, I'm gonna be moving eventually and I'll probably build something uh, that suits my needs at that time. But if you actually come around here, you'll notice pieces of my old Polk style tool, tool trailer everywhere. This whole unit here that's under the table saw, that's all Polk style, that was in my, my tool trailer. So salvage that, put it under the table saw. If you look over here, these units right here of drawers, again, this was all in my tool trailer. Uh, I believe this all was also in there. Also, at a later date down the road, I cut this section out of my workbench to add this pocket hole machine um, so it can pull out really easily. Works really well. And uh, even if you come all the way down here, I've got some big drawers. These were also all in my tool trailer at one point. So a lot of this stuff just got salvaged from that trailer when I switched from using a trailer to a van. So let's talk a little bit about what do you actually need to have a really efficient shop. I see a lot of different shops that are using, you know, extremely expensive sliding table saws. They've got every shaper and piece of equipment under the sun, but what do you actually need? And for me, it's actually pretty amazing. You only need a few pieces of equipment to do 
almost everything, a tremendous amount of work. So let's talk about what you need and don't need in a shop. First off, your most important piece, your workhorse in the shop is gonna be your table saw area. This is where you're gonna be processing a lot of plywood, a lot of ripping and stuff like that. For a small shop, um, this is a five horsepower saw stop table saw. I absolutely have loved this table saw. I don't like the sliding table. I've kept it simply because I don't have space over here to build a larger outfeed table and side feed table. So this has worked okay, but actually putting um, the, the gauge that comes with it on here never stays calibrated, so I don't hardly ever use that. But your table saw is the workhorse of your shop. It's essential. If you're gonna spend a little money, spend it on this because you're gonna spend a ton of time on it. Also, your miter saw setup. We've touched on that a little bit. This isn't the most ideal setup. Doesn't cost you much to get a decent miter saw. Um, that DeWalt miter saw has, you know, it's been fantastic. I've used it for a long time uh, and it, it works great. So that doesn't cost you very much. A table saw like this will cost you a little more. I do like the saw stop because, hey, an accident can happen to anyone. It's very cheap insurance to ensure that I don't lose fingers and that I can keep doing what I'm doing for a long time. And then also, if I ever have my kids or employees that would be using this, I just love the saw stop concept. So some of you might not be familiar with what a saw stop table saw is. This is a saw that actually will stop the blade in a fraction of a second if it makes contact with your body or really anything that would conduct electricity. So there is constantly electricity running through this blade and if I basically touch it, it changes that current, the saw detects it and it'll immediately stop the blade. So you'll see here as I touch this blade, obviously it's not running. Look down in this light here, I touch it and you'll see that light turns on. If I had this saw running while I did that, it would jam a cartridge into the blade and stop it instantaneously. The next really key pieces of equipment that I use a lot that I would say are essential would be the planer. This is a five horsepower Powermatic planer. Um, I think it's about 20 inches wide and it's got the helical head. I would highly encourage you uh, to spend a little bit of extra money, get the helical head. I also went with five horsepower. That's been plenty of power for everything that I've needed it to do. Um, so this has been a great unit overall. That's one of the workhorses in this shop. I use it a lot. Then if we go over here, right behind the miter saw area, we have the jointer. Again, this is a Powermatic jointer. Um, it has the helical head as well. I'm sorry for how horrendously rusty it is right now. I actually am not even sure what's going on. I think some water got sprayed around here or something because it just really started to rust. But it does have uh, the helical head on there. Gets a great finish on there as well. This is key whenever I'm building cabinetry and I'm uh, making styles and rails. A lot of times I wanna make sure those are nice and crispy and straight edges. So I use this a fair amount for that type of thing. The next extremely important area, very productive area is gonna be your assembly area. So for me, I've got this uh, rolling toolbox right here. Uh, it's kind of a catch-all area up here on this countertop, but all of my assembly happens here on this table, and then I also do all of my sanding in this area as well. If we look up above here, this is a boom arm that I rigged up, and it's been probably the best improvement that I made in this shop. Um, so it's just perfect so that as I move around, the hose follows me and as you can see, it just stays at the right level with the sander for whatever I'm sanding, if I'm using the track saw, whatever it may be. Um, the hose goes up and down to a midi, Festool midi vacuum over there, but that's been a fantastic improvement. If you look up there, basically all it is, it's, it was a really large caster 
wheel that I took the rubber wheel off and then I just jammed a two inch poplar dowel rod through there and it just works amazingly well. So this is uh, my assembly area, my main work area. This is where I'm always standing. And for productive production carpentry, it's all about minimizing footsteps. So I have all of the key things that I need right here, basically within arm's reach. Uh, workbench right here could be a whole lot better, but again, I've salvaged this and I've kind of made do with it for a long time. A lot of tools I will have underneath here. Um, I do have this space where I'll throw different things. I've always got a square tucked in right here that I use. Um, and then around here, I've got some clamps and the most common tools that I use. Um, I use this for a lot of edging. Um, whenever I'm putting nosing for bookshelves and stuff like that, jigsaw is handy to have around. I've got my router with my Collins plywood prep bit right here, and then a couple other routers with the common bits that I would be using to ease edges, flush trim, and, and things like that when I'm building built-ins. So for me, this whole area it's really designed and set up for my workflow when I'm building built-in cabinetry, and it works really well. If you look, even on this back wall here of the cabinet, um, it's got my nail guns that I would be most commonly using. Uh, I didn't really clean this up before this video, so I've also got a couple little candy bags here. <laughs> That's essential. Uh, Craig screws, staples, all that good stuff, it's just kind of all right here. And as you all know, there's always uh, a bunch of just random stuff coming in and out through the shop that gets thrown on the workbench and then has to be put away, you know, whatever. So you've always got some random stuff lingering around here as well. So talk a, talking a little bit about wood storage, with me having a small space like this, it's really limited my ability to have much plywood storage um, to keep scraps and things like that. So I'm kind of constrained to this setup here. I do always try to have some, um, obviously a lot of poplar around, uh, leftover pieces from jobs. That way if I need to go home to the shop and make something in the evening, I've got some scrap pieces out here to do that. I usually try to have, this is about normal, just these are kind of some leftover pieces from jobs. And then I usually try to have an extra sheet of sheet or two of quarter inch plywood and three quarter inch plywood, just in case I need to make something out here. But I don't typically have much stored out here. And uh, as a matter of fact, I hate throwing things away, you know, when we're done with a job site, but you can only keep so many, you know, four foot pieces or three foot pieces. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes stuff just doesn't get used up, but I try to use it as much as I can. So that's what this is. I also do have a little bit of storage up here on the ceiling for some long boards. Again, I don't really try to keep much around but there are occasions where maybe we're doing a job in white oak. Most of what's up there right now is white oak and it's special ordered, so it's not gonna be able to be returned, but I'm not gonna just throw a piece of white oak away. So I'll try and hold on to that stuff. And then whenever I need to mill some pieces of shoe molding and white oak to match or something like that, I've got access to some of that here. But as a general rule, with a small space like this, I can't keep much material around. So now looking at this wall, this is uh, kind of the wall that has some stuff that you need and some stuff that you absolutely don't need. Um, and you can kind of notice what you don't need by how much crap is piled on top of the machine. Um, so let's just go down this wall. We've got my heat, my dust collector, my heater setups here with some propane tanks. The fan is here because it helps circulate the air when the heater's running. And then when it's really hot in the summer, I'll run that fan 
also. But then we've got drill press, five horsepower shaper with power feed, uh, Laguna BX18 bandsaw. We've got a nice router table here um, with the whole Incra system. Uh, Conquest 13-bit line boring machine. I've got a ton of Bessie clamps. And then over here, uh, I've got an oscillating edge sander as well. And this is where it gets a little bit tricky for guys who are looking at shops and thinking, man, I'd like to have that, or I need this or that. Most of this stuff I hardly ever touch. So let's just go through it. The edge sander, it's handy. Absolutely would not have to have that with my workflow. Use it once in a while. And when I do use it, I could probably get by um, hand sanding or using some kind of other operation. Wasn't very expensive, but it does take up space. The, this is a clamp rack right here. The metal rack that you see that these are on is, uh, it was a woodpecker one-time tool. It's kind of nice because whenever I'm gluing up a bunch of, say, bookshelves for a library or something like that, I'll actually wheel these clamps all the way over here to where I'm working. It holds a lot of clamps, moves around pretty well. And then uh, down here on the bottom as well, you see I've got a bunch of different woodpecker calls. Those are just an amazing tool. So all of this I would classify as an absolutely fantastic investment. These clamps do cost a fair amount, but to me they're like a lifetime tool. Like they don't really wear out, they don't really get outdated, and they're essential. So this has been a fantastic investment over there, even though there is thousands and thousands of dollars worth of, worth of clamps in my shop. Uh, you just, you gotta have the clamps. Next tool over here, the line boring machine absolutely essential if you're doing a bunch of bookshelves. Um, we did a video on this a while back. Check out that video if you want to learn more about this machine. But that is a machine that's had a very high ROI for me. It's been a great investment. If we move over here, this is uh, a router table. This was probably actually almost the first thing that I had in the shop as far as quote unquote equipment. I thought it would be really cool to have this thing. Um, as you can see by the amount of dust on it, it hardly ever gets used. I'm trying to turn it around here so that you can actually see the front. So if you're gonna have a router table, this Incra fence is the best there is pretty much. It's, it's great to have. Um, but with my workflow, I hardly ever need a router table. It's got a three horsepower router under here. I do have it set up with the dust hoses, so it does have pretty good dust collection when I want to use it. And then uh, drawers with just different router accessories on here. It was a really nice unit to build out, but I just don't hardly ever touch this thing. So. Someday, maybe whenever I have a, a little bit bigger shop, it'll have a little bit better space. But for now, it basically is just always pushed against the wall, collecting dust and serving as a table that I set stuff on. Okay, bandsaw. Bandsaws are something that I really don't need very much. I've used this thing very little there's been a couple custom projects in the last few years that I've used this on, but as, as a whole, I just don't, don't really need it very much. It's one of those tools that whenever you do need it, it's probably the only thing that'll do the job, um, but it's not essential. So when you see this, it's, it's definitely not essential. Moving over here. Five horsepower Powermatic sand, or shaper with a power feeder on it. As you can see, I've got my Freeborn lock miter bit in there. 
this was a phase in my life where I thought lock mitering was the answer to everything. And I've since learned that just using a track saw and doing a miter fold with tape yields the same results, requires way less tools, and you can do the operation in the shop, on the job site, wherever. So I really haven't touched this thing hardly over the last couple years. Um, once I have a larger shop space, I'll probably maybe use this a little bit more, but for now, it's another one of those tools. It's basically always against the wall. I paid a lot of money for it. I bought it brand new, so it wasn't really a great investment here, but uh, I can't bring myself to sell it because I bought it brand new. So it's just hanging around. Drill press, handy sometimes. Again, it's one of those tools I actually just don't use very often. It's a very low cost tool. I mean, you can get a really nice drill press for probably a thousand bucks, but uh, again, it takes up space and I wouldn't have to have it. So I just wanted to show you guys this wall and talk through these tools. So guys who are, who are like me years ago and were trying to think what tools do I actually need, just take some time before you buy shop equipment to really think through if you need it. Because once you buy it, it locks up your space and it's really hard to actually sell, to actually want to get rid of it. But almost all of this stuff on this wall I don't need. Aside from the line boring machine and the clamps, I could get rid of the edge sander, router, bandsaw, shaper, and drill press, and it would literally not affect my workflow at all. So with working out of a smaller shop, it's really important that what you have in your shop space actually needs to be there. And because I've been limited by this size for so long, there's been many times where I've had to just purge stuff, whether that's extra materials that are left over, tools that I didn't need, so on and so forth. I, I cannot stand having just a bunch of crap piled on top of each other in a small space. Um, so I try and keep things as lean and organized as possible. You will see behind me here, this is the staircase that leads up to the storage area above this shop. I wanna show you that. Um, that's been huge. There's a ton of stuff that I keep up here, not just for my shop, but also for my family uh, type stuff. But um, again, this is an area where it's a, it's a mix and a mashup between work and family life up here. So up here in this storage room, again, it's an attic truss, 16 foot wide by 36 foot deep. And there's just a lot of that stuff up here that would normally be in your garage as a homeowner, which we don't have the ability to do because that's my shop. That kind of stuff goes up here. And then also just business stuff related to construction is up here as well. So I've just got a lot of miscellaneous tools. Um, again, I try and keep this space as lean as possible and I've sold so much stuff over the years and just try to keep it cleaned out. Um, but yeah, just all kinds of random stuff, you know, drywall lift for attic ladders. We've got shim blocks for jam masters on top of my kids' toys and stuff pressure washers, water hoses, lawn maintenance stuff. It's just everything else kind of goes up here. Um, so this has been a really key space to keep the shop area somewhat clean and lean and efficient with not too much clutter. So I wanna kind of end this video talking about just what are the limits of a space like this? And there's, a lot of stigmas that go with having a garage shop, it kind of feels really uncool. It feels kind of like you're not a legitimate business. Um, and there may be part of that that's true, but the reality on a practical level is that I've been able to make a ton of money out here 
with extremely low expenses because I've made this space work. And it's also allowed me to be extremely present with my family, even while I'm working out here. So for this phase of life that I've been in, it's been a decent thing. It's actually been a great thing. But now that I've, I've been in business for a pretty long time, I've hired a guy, I'm looking to grow a little bit. I've definitely outgrown this space and I'm looking to expand uh, into a larger shop. So there's a time for everything. Um, I kind of, part of the reason I wanted to make this video was because it's like, oh man, I'm looking to get into a larger shop, but I've never even done a shop tour of this shop. So I wanted to show you guys this now, um, but just give you a down to earth practical tour of what life is like running a garage shop. Um, it's been a great financial decision for me. The key to starting a business out is to be able to create high margins, high profits uh, in a way that's lean. And the way I was able to do that was to put in a lot of hours out here that allowed me to grow um, pretty quickly in a very safe and healthy way without taking on debt or business risks and that aligns with kind of the lifestyle that I wanted. So we've sacrificed as a family on not having a garage for a long time, but it's still been you know, a blessing in other ways. So I hope you guys have enjoyed this tour. Let me know what you think of it. Um, and thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next video.